Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas Bertani. I'm the CEO at uh, Provable and Poseidon. And uh, today, I'm going to discuss P-tokens. So some of you may have seen me around uh, during the last few years for other initiatives uh, that I've been uh, uh, leading, such as the Oracleize uh, Oracle service and uh, the Edu wallet. Today, we announced the launch of P-tokens, which is a new project we have been working on during the past year. So the hot topic of the last year mostly has mostly been around decentralized finance, right? Like uh, DeFi. And another hot topic that I think is like greatly underestimated as for the um, like uh, consequences that it could have for the ecosystem is like uh, the cross chain. Like how can we have different uh, blockchains uh, uh, contribute to you know Ethereum's DeFi? And how can we have Ethereum's DeFi to like interoperate with other blockchain tools. So if you look at like statistics around uh, DeFi, you will see that like the vast majority of DeFi platforms, such as like the first uh, 15, uh, are Ethereum based. So out of the first 15, 14 are protocols based on Ethereum. So I think this is quite impressive as a statistic, and the only thing you see there, um, which is not Ethereum-based, is the Lightning Network, which, if I remember correctly uh, from something I've read yesterday, uh, has now been, um, uh, has, now, has now went down, actually, in this list, since uh, WBTC uh, is getting more traction than Lightning Bitcoin itself, which, which is, a bit weird. <laughs> um, I mean, I've been following uh, the developments around Lightning Network uh, and all the different uh, cross-chain efforts for for a while now. And you know, Lightning Network was supposed to become huge uh, in different ways. Um, it's slowly growing, but not. It, it it doesn't really keep up with the growth of DeFi tools we see um, that are being built on Ethereum. So, um, the main factor here to take home is that Ethereum is where most of the DeFi action is currently happening. Uh, I don't think this means um, it will always be like, like that, as I, I see some activity, for example, also on EOS. Like on EOS, there are some tools that are being built there. Not as much as Ethereum, but I think there are there is like a, a trend that should be watched, right? So I think different chains can actually contribute. And the main um, reason to, that I, I think we should uh, like uh, uh, keep in mind is that if you look on the coin market cap at where the the volume is, it's not all on Ethereum, right? Like if you look at the actual volume, like what is um, happening in the ecosystem as for uh, trading uh, activity, you see it's mostly on a centralized token, which is Tether USD, and the second one is Bitcoin. So Ethereum is third, and if you look at the numbers, the volume is like uh, um, relatively low compared to Bitcoin, uh, and also compared to Tether USD. So it doesn't mean it will always be like this, but I think this this is telling us something, which is that one of the main drivers of this ecosystem is the speculation. Why? Because there are there, there are a lot of of expectations, right? I mean, we know that um, you know the different. Uh, tools that are being built on the different blockchains can have like implications that are huge. So people speculate on those assets and the main ones are the biggest ones, such as uh, Bitcoin. Tether is on top of the list because um, it's just a USD equivalent that is used on a variety of exchanges. But um, what tells me that the, this metric ca shouldn't be ignored is the fact that Tether USD is not just the most widely traded asset. It's also the main use case of Ethereum. Like if you look at the Ethereum gas cost, like how much uh, smart contracts are spending on gas, which is like the main metric to monitor the Ethereum usage, you will see that the very first uh, smart contract that uses Ethereum today is Tether USD. So it's a centralized uh, token which is sort of strange, right? Um, so since we are building all these DeFi tools and the growth is like astonishing, I think th this will like take over 
uh, Tether very soon, but still, um, we, we should acknowledge, in my opinion, um, that you know the, the blockchain is still being used a lot for uh, for trading and for moving you know volumes around. So Tether is the main uh, gas eater on Ethereum, just because it's used a lot for trading activities to move liquidity from one exchange to the other. So that's an important use case. Um, and if you look at the size of DeFi, it's one billion, which is a great milestone, right? That we had reached. Um, but it's still really small, not compared to you know the wider financial market, which is much bigger. But even just to the cryptocurrencies one, which is very small today. So if we compare a small market with DeFi, DeFi looks minuscule, minuscule today. It could be much bigger though. So what should we do to make DeFi grow beyond the first billion, which has been like the first milestone after basically one year and a half of uh, very fast development uh, in this space? Um, well, I think that one of the things we need to overcome indeed is the limitations of um, like the blockchain itself, because all DeFi tools today live on the same blockchain, so on, on Ethereum. Meaning that um, we have sort of a, a capping due to, well, first the user base. If you look at the users that hold uh, Bitcoins, for example, it's a much bigger audience uh, than the users that hold uh, Ethereum. If you look the oldest of Ethereum and people that hold the uh, DAI, for instance, you will see that the DAI holders is like very small in number compared to the Ethereum holders. Why? Because the big numbers are there for you know speculation. Like the main holders of Bitcoin on of Ethereum, all these kind of tokens are there because they are they are not insiders, right? They are just people that hold some Bitcoin for the long term, or they hold some Bitcoin, they, they, some Ethereum. They don't even know that DeFi exists yet, because nobody told them, and because it's too complicated. I mean, if we look when we look at the DApps like decentralized applications and the interfaces. I mean, we are making improvements really quickly, and I think the usability is going up at a fast pace, yet it's really complex for an outsider, for someone who doesn't know what um, you know, a smart contract is or why uh, you know, um, he should uh, you know, double check the bytecode and the verification of the smart contract before, before interacting with ADAP and all this kind of stuff. I think it's really complicated and it shouldn't uh, like, uh, be like that in the long run. Yet we want to give guarantees to those users, right? Because DeFi is like decentralized finance, so we want uh, to, to show to everyone why the decentralization aspect is important. So let's come to P tokens now. P tokens are, were basically designed to solve this problem, like the problem of different blockchains not being able to communicate one with the other. Um, it's quite obvious, I guess, on why we decided to focus on this. We, we have been working since 2015 on the Oracle problem, so on, on connecting the internet with blockchain to feed in external data. But today, the main use case on the blockchain are still around, are financial. So they are around moving volume, around moving liquidity. So how do we facilitate uh, the, like, uh, moving the liquidity around between one blockchain and the other? Well, P tokens do exactly that. They enable tokens or crypto assets in general that live on one blockchain to move on a different blockchain. So the logo is the one of a parrot, not by chance, because the parrot can fly, right? And the parrot is like, uh, can mimic what you say. So this is exactly uh, the concept of P tokens. Like uh, you have a token on a blockchain, let's say Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain, and you want to use it for maybe a DeFi, you know, as a collateral for a DeFi platform on Ethereum. So what you need is a token on Ethereum where that contains your Bitcoin. You don't want like complex systems. You don't want. You, you just want to move it quickly from one blockchain to the other and uh, back. Why is speed such important? And I will come back to this later. Well, because if it's not a quick conversion, so if you cannot, if you, if it's not possible to quickly go from one blockchain to the other with your crypto assets, then um, market makers will like find it very complicated to to interact with this and to provide liquidity. 
like market makers are a critical component, uh, you know, in uh, decentralized exchanges, in centralized exchanges, like in all contexts. And the reason why it's important to make it quick is because you don't want them to, you know, stay exposed to the volatility of those assets, and you don't want them to um, basically have to um, pay high fees or uh, to keep a lot of liquidity in different places just to balance for uh, the uh, the slow speed of the system. So actually, <laughs> this came by coincidence, but um, like a couple of weeks ago, Vitalik posted this in a thread around cross-chain uh, DeFi, and he basically described the way P-tokens work without knowing, <laughs> because this wasn't uh, really um, public yet. So um, he says here that basically interoperability can be, can be done in a very simple way, which is by using light clients and Merkle proofs. So basically, you just need like a system where you have a client for one blockchain, like let's say you have a light client for Bitcoin, a light client for Ethereum, and then you need some proofs that show inclusion of a transaction on the two respective blockchains. The moment you have that, you can verify everything you need for the peg-in and peg-out process. So the peg-in process is what we call like the uh, p-tokenization of an asset. So let's say you have Bitcoin, if you do a peg-in um, of Bitcoins from Bitcoin blockchain to Ethereum, you will receive PBTC on Ethereum. So PBTC will be the p-tokenization of uh, Bitcoin. So you did a peg-in of Bitcoin onto Ethereum. And this PBTC on, in the Ethereum context is an ERC-20 token. So it's compatible, well, technically speaking, is an ERC-777, but it's compatible with ERC-20. So it, it is fully compatible with all uh, systems built around ERC-20. And um, actually, it's, indeed, it's quite astonishing that, um, that there was still you know, no good implementation of this bridge, because this was like uh, theoretically uh, discussed and solved back in the days. I, I remember, like, uh, what was the name? BTC Relay, which was a system to do that in, uh, that was built in 2015. So this was like when the Bitcoin, when the Ethereum blockchain went live, like on the, the like few months after the Ethereum blockchain went on mainnet, there were already systems trying to solve this problem. The reason why they don't exist anymore today is that there was no use case. There was no good reason to have Bitcoin on Ethereum. So those projects pretty much died. Today, this is a project that where we could count more than 10 projects working on this same problem of uh, moving Bitcoin on Ethereum. Why? Because now there is a strong need, which is in DeFi, basically. So um, the way we are building P-tokens is like, uh, uh, you, you will see how it works in a second, but we are trying to provide tools that make it simple for all projects to integrate. So providing the ERC-20 on Ethereum as like the form that of a p-tokenized foreign asset is quite an obvious choice in that direction. But since um, p-tokens enable the peg-in and peg-out to be done by anyone automatically, we, provide, pro we decided to provide this p-tokens.js library, which just uh, basically hides the complexity of the system and enables uh, like uh, a DAP to integrate with the peg-in and peg-out. What does it mean? Let's say you have um, a wallet, a DEX, or any DeFi tool. You want to integrate with P-tokens. What you do is um, you use this library, P-tokens.js, and you could do things, I mean, this is too small to read probably. Mm, I should have made it bigger, but um, th this is just a, one ex a simple example. Here with one line, basically you get the deposit address on Bitcoin where to deposit your Bitcoins so that they can be converted into PBTC on Ethereum. So the deposit address you are given is not just a random address. This is not a custodial system. This is a system where the deposit address is pr transparently and provably controlled by a network that basically commits this deposit to the owner of the newly minted PBTC tokens. So what it means is that you need to specify in advance where you want to receive your p-tokenized assets, like PBTC on Ethereum. When you say the address, the system will generate um, a Bitcoin deposit address that is linked 
to the Ethereum one. This is necessary because you need a proof that the deposit is actually asking for a very specific issuance, which is the issuance of the PBTC tokens on Ethereum to a specific address. You don't want to deposit Bitcoins and then maybe someone else receives your PBTC, right? Um, the library then facilitates all the communication with uh, like uh, different components. So for example, you can check the Bitcoin deposit and see when it's confirmed, if the network has acknowledged the deposit, and if the issuance uh, has uh, successfully been completed, so all the steps. So what we foresee is different uh, dApps to integrate so that they can show the different steps and within their you know, interface, they can just show deposit BTC. And what happens is that you receive PBTC straight on their platform. So you don't need to go via third party dApps or anything like that. Anyone can basically give you a deposit address that is probably tied to your Ethereum address and they could integrate it in the platform. And the same thing is for the way out. So even if you want to redeem, let's say you have PBTC, you are given PBTC, or by the DeFi platform, by a friend of yours, whatever, you can just go back to normal Bitcoins via a very simple you know, request to the DAP or to the library. So um, the, the DAP is actually provided anyway. So this is um, like uh, dap.ptokens.io. And if you go there, you can, right now, you can test it and both on mainnet or on testnet, it's on Robsten, on Ethereum, um, and you can try to issue some new PBTC by depositing Bitcoin, or you can try to redeem them. You redeem PBTC, so those get burnt, and you get Bitcoin back on the address you specify. So all this process is transparent and can, can be independently verified by anyone. I will come down to the security implications and technical details in a second. Um, it's actually secured by something that we will release more details on in uh, a few days, which is called the P network. So this is our plan towards uh, decentralization. And I will uh, show in the last slides briefly how it will work. So on testnet, we have currently released uh, PBTC on Ethereum, but we have already released also just on testnet P Litecoin on Ethereum, which is the same process. Of course, they are pretty much compatible, right? It's very little difference between Bitcoin and Litecoin, so that was an easy implementation. Not as easy, uh, not, n what wasn't easy <laughs> is PEOS on Ethereum. So this is like uh, having an EOS token on Ethereum. But we are working also on the opposite, like having, I don't know, PDAI, for example, on uh, EOS, or PDAI on the liquid sidechain. All these kind of connections are possible thanks to P tokens. P tokens are actually built to be flexible. So in the case of Bitcoin, it's not possible to issue tokens on Bitcoin, right? So it's not possible to have the way back. So it's possible to have Bitcoin on Ethereum as a token, but not to have Ethereum on Bitcoin. On EOS, it's possible to do both, like to have both EOS or EOS tokens on Ethereum in a P tokenized form, or to have um, like um, EOS, sorry, or to have uh, the opposite, so Bitcoin um, or sorry, Ethereum or Ethereum-based uh, uh, tokens uh, on EOS uh, as an EOS token. So this is the comparison with the um, like major competitors, let's say. Uh, they, they are different, there are different approaches. I think some of those could uh, coexist, actually. Um, this chart, the, this comparison table is also on our website, if you're interested. Um, and on the website, you actually find the comparison table also with other projects. There are many others. So uh, we don't list all of them, but if you have questions around specific ones, please let me know. And we can uh, discuss the similarities and differences. So um, the, the ones I have actually put in this slide are the non, uh, um, like the non synthetic ones, let's say. Uh, so they are the ones that are actually backed by real Bitcoins. Um, actually, TBTC is sort of in between, but. Um, so, as you can see, like there are different uh, fronts on, on which we could compare them, like uh, the backing mechanism, the governance, uh, the speed, which again is critical for liquidity to come to Ethereum. Without the liquidity, this is completely useless. Like it doesn't make any sense to have Bitcoin on Ethereum if there is no liquidity, because it's uh, it's not like those bridges will be pretty much useless. It means there is no need for it, right? Um, I guess like having uh, that many projects focusing on Bitcoin, on Ethereum, 
means that those projects believe, and time will tell, but I think we, we are right, that there is a strong use case for Bitcoin and Ethereum and that there is a strong need for it. Something else is like the cost, the peg in, peg out cost. Let's keep in mind that on Ethereum, uh, every operation costs gas. So if the peg in cost or the peg out costs a significant amount of gas, this has to be taken into account for market makers' uh, oper uh, operational costs or for other reasons. So we try to minimize that, for instance. We try to keep it as low as possible. Um, and this is possible by basically keeping the architecture simple and by moving most of the complexity of chain while keeping just the verificability on chain. Um, so here, indeed, I, in the last line, I just uh, summed it up for the market making and liquidity appeal um, to understand the implications better. So let's start with WBTC. WBTC is a project which um, is quite, uh, um, I mean, is the major one, is the, is the market leader at the moment. Uh, is the one that started earlier, and uh, it's mostly trusted. I mean, you need to trust the federation uh, of merchants that enable um, basically what we call the peg in and peg out. It's, it's, this is one of the ones with most of the friction, unfortunately. The good part of WBTC is that it's supported by many protocols. It's supported by many lending protocols, by DeFi, other DeFi platforms, and there are many holders. The bad part is that um, you need KYC to do the peg in and peg out, which is not uh, ideal for many, uh, also for some use cases. And it's, it's not automated. So when you convert Bitcoins to WBTC, the process is somehow manual. So it, take, it, also, it, it can take uh, up to 48 hours or something like that. So it's quite, small, uh, quite slow. So it doesn't really work well for market making. Um, and as I said, it's not really decentralized. There, there are like trustworthy parties involved uh, into the process, yet um, it's, uh, it's not decentralized in any way. So what we do with P-tokens instead is having a network of validators secured by trusted computing. So I will dive into this shortly. But in the first phase, we, like, we, we have started with a single node. So in the first version, it's not really decentralized. It will be decentralized once we introduce the network in the coming months. But all the pieces we need to, to get the network in place and to get the guarantees and the incentives in place we want are already there, just on one node. So we are trying, trying to make everything stable enough for it to become a network. Right now there is just one node because it, you get much more complexity the moment you introduce other nodes. I will show this uh, shortly. Um, with P tokens, actually the peg in and peg out speed are like uh, pretty much instant. After you get enough confirmations, um, you get the tokens on the other uh, chain. Um, that's another competitor like TBTC. Uh, TBTC is very interesting. Uh, I personally like the technical construction of it. Unfortunately, for the way it's built, it has several limitations. So some limitations are, for example, the gas costs are not trivial. The speed is uh, controversial. For example, when you, to do the peg out, you need to wait uh, some months after you have done the peg in. You know, when, when you peg in systems into TBTC, if I'm not wrong, you need to wait six months in order to, to go out. So it means that you can go out immediately if you're given someone else's TBTC or if someone buys yours. But it's not something where you can unwrap your wrapped token at any time. It's quite, there is friction because of that reason. And also, it's, um, sort of dependent still by, by Ethereum as a collateral. And um, it's uh, like tied to UTXO. So that's an advantage because it's uh, the verificability of the system is possible thanks to this. Yet um, it becomes like, uh, it doesn't really apply to all chains. For example, let's say, I don't know, let's make a, a prediction, which I hope is wrong, which is that the Telegram uh, blockchain will take over everything and the ton will be there and it will bring a tons of users. Um, I don't know if this will happen. I personally hope, no, hope, hope not to, but um, who knows. So in that case, um, you know, P tokens will still apply for their architecture because it's very agnostic to the blockchain. We already made an integration with EOS, which is completely different from a UTXO model. Um, and this one will need, pr probably will not even uh, possible to verify, but it's, it will be very complex. It will need to be pretty much entirely redesigned. 
So it's not uh, blockchain agnostic in any way, which sort of makes it a standard which doesn't scale depending on the use cases. Like we don't know what are the use cases. I don't know the use cases. I, I don't think the use cases will just be Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think it's much wider. Today we need Bitcoin and Ethereum, but tomorrow we may need a PDI on liquid, or we may need, um, I don't know, um, PUSDT, which is like a EOS token, or PUSDT uh, on a ton, or whatever, I don't know. Um, so uh, RenBTC is another project that um, is similar to P-Tokens. Because of its design, it's actually the closest, I would say, to P-Tokens. Um, it has some uh, limitations, though, because basically the REN system, for the way it's built, is really complicated. Like, it has several components in, like the REN VM, for example, um, or like uh, the uh, the algorithms they use that are still undisclosed. So it, it's, it's really hard to to, describe, to to analyze it in deep because um, some of the details, many details of their system are not public yet. Um, what I can say is that our aim with P-Tokens is the one to design a system which is safe, meaning that it's as simple as possible. So it doesn't aim to do everything well. It aims to um, you know, move liquidity quickly in the safest way. So it tries to be very thin. Having a thin system, like a system that is simple, is the best way to have a system that is transparent and solid. While RenVM is like very complex, so I think complexity and security ne have never like gone well together. So um, I'm a bit late, so I will skip some slides. Um, I think there is no need to dive much deeper into the ecosystem potential. We know DeFi is growing. 20,000 users, is it a big number? Well, it's much bigger than the like uh, <laughs> 2000s we were at uh, one year ago, but I think we can do much better. Uh, and to do that, we need to bring DeFi tools to a wider community. So if we give utility to crypto assets they already have, I think that's a, way, a great way to do that. So uh, we, I, I've already explained the way the peg in and peg out works, so I will not spend time on this. Um, it's currently live on uh, the Ethereum mainnet since this morning, pretty much. Um, so the, you can test it, but I would advise you to test it on testnet. <laughs> so if you go on the DAP, you can like test it on testnet. You can test it on the mainnet as well, and actually we have integrations already uh, that I will show you shortly. And our aim, again, is to keep a very simple design. So that's why we could uh, you know, move quickly with the design of this. Like in one year, we could go from zero to mainnet, basically because the design is really simple. And it doesn't need to do any fancy stuff or to create abstractions layer or anything like that. Like for example, RenVM has so many layers in between that it's really complicated to analyze everything. Um, while here, the design is really simple because the aim, again, is to focus on having a simple system to analyze and, and to keep safe so that you know uh, everyone can quickly move liquidity and things like that. So the token, as I said, uh, well, it's mostly based on an open Zeppelin contract because on chain there is not much happening really. So it's an ERC 777. There are some small additions for the redeem, but the, the smart contract on chain that differs from open Zeppelin is like 100 lines of code. So it's really small. Um, the rest of the system, so the system off chain that keeps the system safe, has been audited by um, Cryptonix. We'll have also all the other audits being uh, released, but this is the first one we have, we have worked on. And there is a peg, again, which is one to one, so this is not a synthetic asset. You can just get your normal Bitcoins, convert them to BTC and back. Um, we are live from today uh, on Bancor as well, so you can use it on Bancor network directly. Um, and same thing with Kyber. So if you have like a DeFi platform that is integrated with Kyber or with Bancor, uh, that's integrated with both already, so you can use it with now without any extra uh, friction, which is great for the integration of uh, systems that are already using those networks. So. There are many use cases. Uh, I don't have much time to dive into all of them, but um, ask me later if you're interested. So some integrations that are uh, going live shortly or already live are, for example, integration with DMAX, 
like DMAX is um, like a, a derivatives platform where basically they have integrated via the P2CanCGS library the entire peg in and peg out process. So you can go on the Ethereum platform on their DAP, you can just do deposit Bitcoin, they give you a deposit address from uh, P tokens, and you receive the PBTC token directly so that you can start trading on their platform. And the way back is the same, basically. So it's the same experience people normally see on centralized exchanges, but decentralized. So you don't need to confuse them with you know, a completely different approach, which is the one that we are following on DApps today. You can give them an experience they are familiar with, um, but with much greater security. Um, Adu is like a mobile wallet that has uh, um, integrated it already. So uh, actually, the, sorry, the, they have integrated the trading for, from Bancor and um, Kyber as that, that was already integrated pretty much. But they are integrating straight into the wallet also the peg in and peg out. So basically, you can just deposit bitcoins on an Ethereum wallet. So think of the applicability of that. Like you have, I don't know, MetaMask. That's a plugin we are making for, uh, we are building for MetaMask. Like you go in MetaMask, which is basically an Ethereum wallet, and you do deposit Bitcoin. You are given the P tokens uh, deposit address, and you receive BTC directly. Or opposite, you have PBTC, you go back, you withdraw Ethereum from MetaMask. Like the, ex the user experience is the same you would have on a different tool. Basically, you can make all Ethereum tools, um, you know, chain agnostic, and just support the uh, uh, withdrawals and deposits from exchanges, from anything directly on any chain. Uh, this is useful, of course, also for lending derivatives. There is no need to say that, right? Um, so um, I just have a couple of minutes. So I will uh, now dive a little bit with an anticipation of the governance network, and I will explain to you technically um, how the system works. So basically, well, this is a tweet from a few days ago from Chris, which is an influencer um, in the DeFi, I guess. And uh, something he said, which is a very hot topic, is that you know we shouldn't really um, accept any DeFi tool which is centralized today if they don't provide a clear roadmap towards decentralization. Which makes sense, right? I mean, th th this is a great uh, uh, point, I think, on the fact that you know we don't want uh, projects that are undercover centralized in DeFi because otherwise everything blows up. So for example, we have been running an Oracle service for five years um, that is centralized. I'm not scared to say that because I think there is a, some, like a strong argument in favor of those kind of approaches, but I don't say it's a DeFi Oracle because it is not. Yet, there are many uh, projects that today live in DeFi that have many points of failure that are centralized and they don't disclose them. So what we want to do is make it very clear on where decentralization points are and uh, show our path towards decentralization. Like how do we achieve decentralization? What's the time frame? Um, and why? So for example, now we are starting with a single node and providing guarantees of trusted computing, meaning that um, like the machine where this is running can be shut down. So if we shut it down, you will not be able to redeem the tokens in this phase. If you don't find this acceptable, test it on testnet and maybe jump in later once uh, the, you don't, the, this problem doesn't exist anymore. But keep in mind that most of the alternatives, well, all the alternatives on mainnet today don't provide additional guarantees. They actually provide lower guarantees. So this is something you're already accepting as a compromise with existing alternatives. Yeah, so it's better and it will be much better, basically. <laughs> um, so in phase zero, we just have one node with guarantees of trusted computing. Meaning that if something goes wrong, there is the possibility actually here in this phase, we have enabled uh, something we call a uh, debug function to have the possibility to recover funds. Why? Because the system is thin, much thinner than alternatives that are coming up, yet it's very complicated. Many things could break. So we want to stay on mainnet for like some weeks and see how the system works with one node, but all the pieces we need for like going towards a network like, that we call the P network um, is like, um, uh, they are, all, are already in place. We just don't feel confident yet to push it out. So this is why we are targeting quarter two. And quarter three is actually where we plan to um, provide a voting system so that people from the community where we will have a very minority stake, uh, like a very small part of control, will be able to choose what they want to do with the 
um, you know, with, with the system, if they want to upgrade or not, what kind of bridges they support, uh, what, what the peg in and peg out fee should be, or things like that. And they will be able to collect the fees directly with the nodes that you know, support the system. So this is basically a system which is uh, in between uh, purely like uh, decentralized systems um, that use MPC only, that use multi-party computation. So those systems typically need the, each node to put enough money at stake so that the total value they are securing doesn't go beyond the total value at stake. This is its main limitation because it, it's based on the wrong assumption, in, in my opinion, that like those governance tokens, because they are governance tokens in the end, should keep rising in value if you need to secure more, which I don't think it's uh, healthy as an assumption. While our system basically says, okay, we use a pure governance system, so people vote, they can use it, they can be slashed in some circumstances, but uh, normally we make much harder for single nodes to do something else, like to attack, because there is a variety of TES techniques that are used to secure their execution. So anyone can challenge at any time uh, a node in the network uh, to see if the attestation is passing. So if according to the TE, they are operating normally. So how do you break the network? Well, you can break the network if you break basically uh, the TEs from uh, uh, Ledger, Intel, and Google to start with, at the same time in a controlled way, in a way that is undetectable, and in the majority of the network. So I think it's possible uh, in principle from a theoretical point of view, but I think it's much easier to just uh, dump uh, a small token on an exchange and make uh, the like network incentive uh, of uh, the, the other systems go down to a lower level. So what I'm saying is that practically speaking, I think the system is much safer uh, than the alternatives and it provides no capping based on the value locked in the staking of the token. So that's great for scalability. Um, so there will be like some token holders that will just keep the token for their own reasons, uh, maybe because they want to benefit from peg in, peg out fees or things like that. There will be some like that, they will some that just vote for governance and decide if the enclave code that every validator needs to run uh, needs to uh, like be updated or if the fees need to change. Um, and then there will be some validators. It is a subset of all of this. Uh, and those validators uh, will um, keep the system safe with their specific machines providing some guarantees, which is better than no guarantee, um, and will help to secure the network. So basically, just to make this clear, we are not raising funds. This is not a new token. We don't plan to do any of that, and we will not be in control of the majority of the tokens. So I think this is quite rare because we don't plan to you know, hide uh, the fact that the company behind uh, the initial design controls the network, as many tokens do, uh, because they keep the majority of the tokens. Um, and th this is like a, a system where, which can solve the cross-chain uh, um, composability problem for DeFi. It can do it today in a very simple fashion, without you know buzzwords, without extra complexity. It's something that everyone can understand. So if you're interested, our Telegram channel is just called P Tokens, and the details around the governance system will be available shortly on p.network. Um, and yeah, the DAP is available on the website, and you find all the details on GitHub. Or if you want to reach out to me come talk to me in person, even if I'm Italian, I've never, I've not been in Italy for the last two months, so don't worry about coronavirus, um, and that uh, email address you can use to remotely reach out to us. Thank you. Uh, the next conference has been cancelled, so if you want, we have time for questions. Is Anyone? there any question, from, maybe from the Witnick guys? So if I have a wallet, uh, why should I use P token rather than just uh, um, or PBTC rather than BTC? Is there any financial incentive for me to implement this? That's a very good question because one of the um, like um, competing uh, um, projects uh, that is called IMBTC is actually paying users to uh, with the the, the 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 holders of the of the token they have, which is called IMBTC, um, get a share of the fees of peg in and peg out. I think that's great, but I mean 
Um, it doesn't make any sense uh, from an incentive perspective, in my opinion. Um, so, no, you don't get paid for, uh, for moving your Bitcoin on a different chain. You may make money if, I don't know, you lend it. Maybe you get your Bitcoins, uh, you convert it to PBTC, and then, I don't know, you go on Compound or on Aave or on other platforms, and you lend it. So maybe you will get some interest back. Um, so this is something that is enabled by a, a system like that. So you get the guarantee, the transparency guarantees of the DeFi tools on assets that you may want to hold in the long run. Maybe you don't want to put there some, uh, you know, DAI. You want actually to keep your Bitcoins and say, I don't plan to sell them in the next years. I will just put them in lending in a DeFi platform on Ethereum. So is there any other advantage? Well. Um, as I said, an advantage is that, uh, well, this is the ADU wallet. So you see here, there is both Bitcoin and PBTC. That's just because the Ethereum wallet supports both the Ethereum chain and the Bitcoin one. Many wallets, such as MetaMask, they don't support Bitcoin. So in that case, you may have some Bitcoins on an exchange. Maybe you want to go to you know, a non-custodial uh, one. So you want to withdraw the Bitcoins from the exchange. You don't have a Bitcoin wallet. You have all your crypto assets on Ethereum already. With PBTC, you can just withdraw to your deposit address of P-tokens, and you receive directly PBTC. That's non-custodial, and you are safe. It's better than keeping them on the exchange, yet you didn't have to install a Bitcoin wallet. Any other question? Thank you.